Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report, and uh, we have got a lot to cover today. Stay seat. Hey, Max, in the second half, we speak to the vice president of El Salvador, and soon after we wrapped our interview with him, the news broke from the Committee on Foreign Relations in the U.S. Senate. This is remarkable. Here is the headline. Rish Menendez Cassidy introduced legislation to mitigate risks of El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin. U.S. Senators Jim Rish of Idaho, Bob Menendez of New Jersey, ranking member and chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and Bill Cassidy of Louisiana today introduced the Accountability for Cryptocurrency in El Salvador, the ACES Act, legislation requiring a state department report on El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin, a cryptocurrency as legal tender, and a plan to mitigate potential risks to the U.S. financial system. I'm going to read the next quote from one of these senators, just so you see the, the scale of the threat that Bitcoin poses to the United States dollar. Because here, El Salvador is like a $25, $30 billion economy, and they're saying this about Bitcoin as legal tender here. El Salvador's adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender raises significant concerns about the economic stability and financial integrity of a vulnerable U.S. trading partner in Central America, said Rish. This new policy has the potential to weaken U.S. sanctions policy, empowering malign actors like China and organized criminal organizations. Our bipartisan legislation seeks greater clarity on El Salvador's policy and requires the administration to mitigate potential risks to the U.S. financial system. And they go on to actually say it undermines the role of the U.S. dollar as reserve currency. Right. Um, I was pretty shocked by this, really. I mean, I knew the dollar was vulnerable and I knew the dollar was in trouble, but I didn't know the U.S. dollar was in this much trouble that a country like El Salvador, as you point out, it's a $35, $40 billion economy. By them making Bitcoin legal tender, what these senators are suggesting is that it threatens the entire U.S. world reserve currency, the dollar, the U.S. dollar hegemony. And that can only be true if the United States dollar and its satellite client states around the world are engaged in the massive Ponzi scheme like Bernie Madoff. So I, 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 I can't understand why anyone reading that wouldn't want to just go all in on Bitcoin because as the dollar is now, they've shown their hand, it will without question now collapse. Um, and Bitcoin, as Paul Tudor Jones has said, is the fastest horse in the race. Um, I, I can't imagine anyone holding dollars at this point. It, it, it's, it's absolutely untenable. You must be insane to hold dollars. You know, in terms of the U.S. dollar reserve, here's the quote about that. And then I'm going to um, say a, a few thoughts about this. El Salvador recognizing Bitcoin as official currency opens the door for money laundering, cartels, they always say that, and undermines U.S. interests, said Dr. Cassidy. If the United States wishes to combat money laundering and preserve the role of the dollar as a reserve currency of the world, we must tackle this issue head on. So they are being very blunt about what they see. And in terms of understanding geopolitics, geoeconomics, monetary policy, so when you look at the U.S. as a deindustrialized, dilapidated nation, that's important. That has to happen. If it were the opposite, that would undermine the role of the U.S. dollar, for example, as a reserve currency. Because if there were manufacturing in the U.S., if there were a flourishing middle class, if the industrial heartland still existed, the U.S. dollar could not maintain its reserve currency status. Because remember, the Triffin Dilemma, you need to send all those dollars abroad. You need to have a huge number, uh, you know, massive imports versus exports. So you need to send all your dollars overseas. That's the only way to do it. Also, the petrodollar. We've covered that over the entire Middle East. When you look at what's happening in Libya, when you look at what happened in Iraq or Yemen, uh, you know, the the need to maintain that petrodollar in order to back the dollar because the f peace in the Middle East is a total lie. Like if there were peace in the Middle East, we would have a problem maintaining the reserve currency status. So they're saying it out loud that, that this is actually their policy. Yeah, I mean, all excellent points. And, and also keep in mind when they talk about Bitcoin being used in criminal activity, the use of Bitcoin in criminal activity peaked several years ago at 1.5% of global criminal activity, and it's crashed. It's now 
one five percent of criminal activity and it'll probably go to zero because no criminal in their right mind would use Bitcoin in a criminal activity because it's totally transparent on the open ledger, the blockchain. So that's just the st categorically patently false, what they've said there, and that's their lead statement. And then everything else that they imply is equally fallacious. Indeed, and of course we uh, covered this in a previous episode here from El Salvador, and that is that we were sitting with the the, you know, the co-founder of Bitfinex, right when the news broke that the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI had arrested and re returned and seized three and a half billion dollars with a Bitcoin that had been stolen in a hack from Bitfinex Bitcoin Exchange back in 2016. So it was traceable. They found it. They, they got the Bitcoin back. Now, in terms of with the sovereign nation, the leader of this sovereign nation of El Salvador, how he responded to the U.S. senators um, threatening El Salvador. Okay, boomers, you have zero jurisdiction on a sovereign and independent nation. We are not your colony, your backyard, or your front yard. Stay out of our internal affairs. Don't try to control something you cannot control. Because of course you can't control Bitcoin. That's the thing. Is it censorship resistant? Uh, you know, they could take you off Swift all they want. Have your dollar. Game over for fiat. We've got Bitcoin, right? So it's censorship resistant. It provides individual sovereignty to the individual human being, but apparently, as you see, to the independent sovereign individual nation. Right. Uh, as we've said now for many, many years, you cannot enforce a ban on Bitcoin. Countries have banned it. They found that they couldn't enforce the ban and they flipped. They became supporters. They are now hoarding. They're now buying. They're mi mining Bitcoin. Uh, this is true now in Ukraine. They just made a move to legalize Bitcoin. It's true in Russia. They're now moving toward Bitcoin. It's true in India. It's true in Germany. The policymakers are saying, you can't stop it. We can't stop it. They realize now that game theory is on and they need to start mining and hoarding Bitcoin or be left behind. The U.S. could be in a very, very dangerous position right now in terms of human rights for the population because it's effectively uh, not defending itself against the encroachment of Bitcoin superpowers. Right. So let's move on to the next headline. Uh, that is a, an interesting one happening here about Bitcoin on the balance sheet of these nations and the achieving some sovereignty from a decaying empire that's collapsing and uh, it's going to start la to lash out. But, you know, the other thing that the president of El Salvador, Najib Bukele, has done is tell the IMF to co go pound sand, essentially. And I want to show you a headline that's kind of been missed over the past two weeks. I certainly had missed it because there's so much happening here. But this is a proposal in Lebanon to deal because Lebanon right now, they think they need a bailout from the IMF. But in order to get a bailout from the IMF, they have to deal with the situation in their banks with the billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars of bad debts. Now, remember back in 2019, they seized, they froze all funds, any, any dollars, U.S. dollars that you had in a bank account in Lebanon has been frozen this whole time. So here's a proposal about how to disperse this over $100 billion in U.S. dollar cash that they've seized. Lebanon plan sees 93% currency slide, turns bulk of FX deposits two pounds. A government plan for tackling Lebanon's financial crisis projects a 93% devaluation of the Lebanese pound and converts the bulk of hard currency deposits in the banking system to local currency according to a blueprint seen by Reuters. Of $104 billion of hard currency deposits, the plan foresees returning just $25 billion to savers in U.S. dollars, with most of what is left converted to pounds at several exchange rates, including one that would wipe out 75% of some deposits. So this plan has been like they keep on going back and forth over the past three years. And basically, the debate has been who eats the cost? Who has to pay for this? Is it the government? and the central bank? Is it the bankers and all their bad debts? Or is it the depositors? And this new plan sees the depositors, the ordinary Joe Bag of Donuts in, Elsa, in Lebanon. Right. Well, when we visited Beirut, Lebanon, seven or eight years ago, Bitcoin was five, six hundred dollars. We met a young man named Saif Dean Amous, told him about Bitcoin. 
Within a couple of years, he started buying Bitcoin and he wrote the book, of course, The Bitcoin Standard. And he's not suffering this massive devaluation or the many, many people in Lebanon we told to buy Bitcoin at that time. They're not suffering this devaluation. Uh, same thing goes for Canada right now. Can Canadian banks look like there's a lot of trouble going on there. Countries talking about confiscation and freezing accounts. Uh, those folks that own Bitcoin in Canada will make it. They'll get to the other side. If you don't, you'll probably get destroyed. But same is true now in the United States and in countries all over the world. If you don't own Bitcoin, you're going to be destroyed. I might add that, in fact, we did meet Dr. Saif Dina Moose in 2011 and we told him about Bitcoin. And if you look at the price chart of Bitcoin, you'll see that it was actually one dollar. He then did contact us when it was six hundred dollars, I think, in 2013 or 14. And uh, we helped him figure out how to buy some Bitcoin. And now he is like one of the leading thinkers in the Bitcoin space. Um, in terms of the $69 billion in losses that have to be eaten by somebody, here's what the article in Reuters points out. Dividing the losses. This time, the losses are divided out as follows. $38 billion by the depositors, $13 billion through a reduction in the capital of banks' shareholders, and $10 billion in a government perpetual bond, and $8 billion by the central bank. So as you see, it's ordinary depositors that are having to bail this situation out, just as ordinary depositors had to bail out Cyprus, this, well, bail in Cyprus. This is the bail-in model, and it's coming for other nations around the world as this game over for fiat accelerates. And like our friend Saif Dina Moose in uh, Lebanon at that time, like he got Bitcoin, he got wise, and he got it at the price he deserved. And, you know, look at the game theory going on here. You know, you either get it or you don't. Yeah, like we've been saying for 11 years, only keep money in the bank, only keep fiat money that you're willing to lose. Uh, if you anything you want to save, you need to put it in Bitcoin. Every, everything else will be taken, a bail-in, as they call it. Well, look at what Canada is doing. They've rewritten all of their emergency laws to seize not only your bank accounts, but your securities accounts, any portfolio, uh, stock portfolio you have, uh, housing, like everything. They could seize all of your wealth if you are protesting their policies. <laughs> wow. And I just thought it was a lot of maple sugar. All right, well, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, much more coming your way. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Time now to turn to a very special guest, the Vice President of El Salvador, Dr. Felix Uwoa. Welcome. Thank you, Max. Now, what's happening right now is that there's a shift in the global economy. And the center of power in the U.S. with the U.S. dollar is being challenged. It's being challenged by something called Bitcoin. And it's all happening in El Salvador. You're the vice president. First of all, how did you, what, how did you become vice president? What's your relationship with President Bukele? Oh, well, this is a long story. Uh, I met him since uh, his, he was a mayor of a very small town. And then he, when he expressed his interest in getting elected as a president, as a mayor of the capital city. I joined his team. So we worked in his campaign. We won. And he became uh, mayor of San Salvador in 2015. Then uh, when we decide, he decided to run for president. He called me to be part of his team also. And we were working on it. Uh, finally, when he got all the opposition for the whole system, uh, economic powers, uh, institutions, political party, the traditional media, everybody was trying to impede him to run for office. Uh, we fought, uh, and we find out some ways to get him uh, registered as a candidate. But the last movement of the traditional system was to cancel the political party who allowed him to be part of it. Then we decide, well, this is only one chance. And the one chance was two hours away of the deadline to get registered. And he found uh, this party, Ghana. Uh, he called me. Uh, I thought that I was called as a lawyer because I was a legal advisor. But my surprise was when he said, OK, you sign here. I said, what for? He said, because you will be part of my ticket. So we are the ticket that I was uh, surprised. I couldn't even check with my you know, my relative, my wife, etc., because we were half an hour 
away from the deadline. So I immediately signed it because it was a sort of commitment from the, the whole Salvadorians. We, once he said, don't leave me alone, he claimed that. And that was a sort of, you know, anthem that everybody was telling, we won't let you alone. And at that moment, he asked me to be part of, the, of his ticket. I couldn't say, okay, let me check. No, no. Immediately I react, I send in, and then we started the campaign. We were elected, and here I am now. Right, and this is the New Ideas Party. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, New Ideas Party was his project, the political project, who, the, I mean, that party was not allowed to run in the presidential elections at that moment. Because I said, the whole system, the whole legal system was trying to impede him for running uh, for office. Right. Let me just ask you a question generally about politics in El Salvador and also in Central America, and you could say in Latin America. There's always been this tension between left and right, and it's been going on for decades, where you have left-wing parties are populist, and they talk about wealth redistribution and land redistribution, and then that doesn't work out very well. And then a right-wing comes in, and they aggregate power, and they aggregate uh, land and power, et cetera. And this dance has been going on for decades. Here in El Salvador, President Bukele seems to have shattered this paradigm and introduced a brand new paradigm. And he's introduced Bitcoin. Uh, when, when he first told you about Bitcoin, I'm assuming he told you about it, um, what, did, what were your thoughts at that time? Well, I thought, I don't know if you are familiar with some sort of essay, political essay, from Francis Fukuyama. It was written in the last century. Yes, in 1990, 1992, he wrote an essay yeah, called yeah. The End of History. The End of History. So that idea was that it wasn't the end of the history. It was the end of ideologies. And he claimed that the liberalism will be, you know, the, the future for the mankind. In El Salvador, I think that that prediction from Fukuyama that it was the end of the ideology is coming like a, a true, it's a, the reality. Because uh, as I repeatedly said, President Bukele is not a man of ideology. He's a man of ideas. And that idea, the great idea as, you know, adopting a, as a legal currency, a cryptocurrency, it's, it's, it's like a, a disruptive vision, not only on politics, but also on economic. And for El Salvador, that means that El Salvador has been uh, put now in the leadership worldwide in uh, that, that situation that you mentioned, the challenge of the fiat currency as the dollar has right. been. Right. Let me, let me jump in here for a second. So you mentioned Francis Fukuyama. He had a very famous essay in 1990, The End of History. And it really referred to the end of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I know people in the United States interpreted that as we won, they lost. Uh, but here we are in the year 2022, and it doesn't seem as though the United States and Great Britain and Europe understood the lesson of the end of history, as well as El Salvador, as you're describing it. It seems as though, as you are uh, giving our, your view of that uh, essay, very famous essay, is that um, the end of history means the end is the beginning of politics driven more by ideas than ideology. Is that a fair thing to say? That is absolutely correct. And as you said, uh, the Western didn't understood the, the lesson of the history. They thought that because the Soviet Union fell apart, I mean, the, the Western won this battle between the, uh, the East and the West, meaning the socialism or capitalism. And that is not n neither the current, uh, the current situation uh, nor uh, what was the result of the fell down of the Soviet Union. Okay, this what, is incredible because in the United States, people are still debating socialism versus capitalism, and there's a big move in the United States now back to socialism. When you hear something like universal basic income, when you hear about politicians talking about uh, issues that are uh, fall under the heading of social justice and this type of thing, this is patently socialistic. Uh, whereas El Salvador has said, you know, we're beyond that. We're moved beyond that. And with Bitcoin giving the possibility to break the paradigm, what is it about Bitcoin that allows a country like El Salvador to make such a bold 
uh, kind of move into the future. What, what is it about Bitcoin? You know, Bitcoin means uh, the freedom, the freedom of financial decision making process, because so far the fiat currency has been uh, the, the tool for a way of a sort of dictatorship of the big, big superpowers. Uh, you could say the US dollar, you could say the euro, you can say the, the, the pound, the, the British uh, sterling pound. So whatever uh, fiat currency is dealed by the central banks or by the federal, the Fed in the United States, it means that you have the control. And if you control economy, you can, con you can control politics, even culture. I mean, you control everything. So when this new way, the, this sort of new revolution in the financial fields worldwide, it show up, I mean, immediately, the people worldwide is, is, is like breathing a new earth of, of freedom. And we have seen the reaction of the, of the you know, the, the multilateral institution, financial institution, for instance. Like the IMF. Like the World Bank, like IMF, all this. I mean, but so far, I think that they have understood that this is a, a battle that they never will win. Because Do you think they understand that? The I don't get the impression no, they know that they've lost this battle. Well, I think they're still uh, kind in, of in fighting. Public, in the public statements, they will still challenge that, and they will still warming the nation, the governments, don't run that risk. You are losing, like you said, no? This, uh, the, this company, like the Moody's or uh, Fitch. the Fitch or the Standard & Poor's, that say, you know, El Salvador is losing the great because the, bit money, the, the Bitcoin. I mean, I think those are a sort of threat just to discourage, uh, as the President Bukele said, not because we have oil or we have gold or we have diamonds or we have uh, natural resources, because we could be a bad example for others. I mean, El Salvador start being, you know, uh, focused on, 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 the, on the world economic think tanks. And many people are more than curious. They are interested in coming to El Salvador. Many people have called me from Europe, from South America. The last call I received from, was from Mexico. Uh, people that are interested to come over here and try to do some sort of research, to, to socialize with uh, uh, officials of the economic system, financial system in El Salvador, to see how, can, how we are managing this project. And basically, how can we build the legal framework to allow this new uh, economic and financial system, the, 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 the currency of the Bitcoin as a legal tender in El Salvador, it needs a sort of a legal I infrastructure. And we are dealing with that. That means that El Salvador has now uh, this harmony between the executive branch and the legislative branch. Okay, now, that's interesting. So let's, let's focus on that. So first of all, you began by talking about freedom. Yeah. And freedom seems to be the exact opposite of what the IMF is interested in, what the World Bank is interested in, what all the central banks are interested in. They're interested in control. They're not interested in freedom. So if you have a country that is now openly free and the population is free and you have an unconfiscatable wealth, that's a challenge and a, and a threat to their model of control, is, is what I'm hearing. Uh, you also said something very interesting. So with Bitcoin, the harmonization between the executive, the legislative, and the, um, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches of government, there's harmony. Talk about that a little bit. That's fascinating. Uh, yeah, because, you know, uh, at the beginning, we were, I mean, the image of the President Bukele was presented as a new dictatorship, a new way of dictatorship. He was called the millennial dictator, and this kind of, you know, black legends. I mean, something that uh, it isn't absolutely not true. Now, people are realizing that he has a strong leadership. And being a strong leader, that he has a very wide, popular, back support from the population. Now is the, the time of the institution to, to present to him this back support. And that is the time of the new legislature, the new National Assembly that was elected in February 2020, 2021, that means kind of one year ago. He took office on May the 1st. And from first day, many laws were submitted 
to the legislature from the executive that during the two years that we were in office, because we were elected in, 19, in 2019, so we had to wait two years until a new assembly, a legislature was elected. And now with this harmony, we have proved that the three branches of the government, the judiciary, the legislative and the executive are working uh, in harmony and in the same way. All right. So we're going to cut it off there. We're going to come back and do a second segment. Okay. But for now, we say goodbye. Dr. Felix, thank you. Okay. My pleasure. <laughs> Stay right there. Don't okay. go away. I won't move. Nice chairs. Uh, that's going to do it for this edition of the Kaiser Report with me, Max Kaiser, and Stacey Herbert. Again, thanks to our very special guest, Dr. Felix Uoth, the Vice President of El Salvador. Till next time. Bye, y'all.